Oh my goodness. Bad touching, harassment, sex, violence, fraud, threats. All things that could have been avoided if you had Fama. Stop hiring dangerous people. Fama.io All right, I want to talk to you for a moment about retaining and developing your workforce. It's hard. Recruiting is hard. Retaining top employees is hard. Then you've got onboarding, payroll, benefits, time and labor management. You need to take care of your workforce, and you can only do this successfully if you commit to transforming your employee experience. This is where ISOF comes in. They empower you to be successful. We've seen it with a number of companies that we've worked with, and this is why we partner with them here at WorkDefined. We trust them, and you should too. Check them out at isolvedhcm.com. Hey, this is William Tincup and Ryan Leary, and you're watching and hopefully listening to the Use Case Podcast. Today we have David on from Talent Neuron, and we're going to be learning all about the use case, business case, for why people choose Talent Neuron. David, how are you doing today? Great. Thank you, sir. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Ryan, how are you doing? Oh, I'm fantastic, man. We got David on. We're going to talk Talent Neuron, and we're going to get smart. Here we go. Here we go. David, <laughs> would you do us a favor and introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, David Wilkins. I am our Chief Product and Marketing Officer here at Talent Neuron. Been in the HCM space now for, uh, I guess, sad to say, over 30 years. No, 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 no. Oh, no, we wow. We don't use years. We don't use years. He just dated <laughs> himself. So in 1953, I joined. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> after after yeah. I worked on the atomic bomb. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so true story, guys. I was in a board call a couple of weeks ago and uh, noted when I started my career and said that I had been in this space about 24 years. Right. And then one of our board members, in fact, our chairman of the board said, Dave, I think your math is wrong. It's actually yeah. like thirty-four years. <laughs> That's Dude. that was a that was yeah. a disheartening moment. I must yeah. say to lose ten years I, yeah. like that. Yeah. No, I delete yeah. my LinkedIn profile only goes back to twenty years. Okay, good. Call. So I deleted right. everything below twenty, and, That's I, fair. and in twenty twenty-five it'll go to two uh, yeah. two thousand five. Okay. I'll always only have a rolling twenty. I'll always. <laughs> <laughs> this guy just never ages. He never ages. It. Like yeah. no, you it. know what? Um, I love that you put product and marketing together. How did that, how did that, cause a lot of companies don't, they products over here, marketing over there, sales over here, you know, yeah. how did, how did y'all uh, agree on putting those two things together? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I've, I've kind of bounced around between the two over a lot of my career. So I've, I've run marketing a few times, product a few times, been a chief strategy officer, been a general manager a couple of times of like product lines within SAS. So when we were constructing this, I, I came in last October to Talent Neuron. Um, Julie, who's the CEO, actually had a real similar background to me where she's been in product, been in marketing, been a head of strategy, and obviously run as a CEO a lot of companies. So she and I both really similarly, I think, see that when you do marketing at the high enough level, then you have to know the market, you have to know competitors, you have to know the needs of your clients, you have to know where the space is going. And if you're doing product at a high enough level, you have to know all that. And you have to know where the product should go and how to shape strategic direction. So at the right level of strategy, they kind of start to overlap a lot in meaningful ways. Mm -hmm. um, and given the space that we're in is a little bit still kind of being built out, it's a little category creation, kind of makes sense to kind of ram it all together and, and think about it holistically, you know? I love it because it's not a lot of this, the yeah. blaming of... Well, the product <laughs> people aren't saying, marketing doesn't get it. Yeah, marketing yes, say, yeah, oh, yeah. product people, they're crazy. Yeah. Now I just look at the mirror and just yell at myself. That's yeah. exactly well, right. Only if yeah. marketing would send me the right people. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it works. That's how it works. Yeah. So we're, I know we're going to jump in the product, but before we do that, David, do you find, because the, the setup, the structure you have here is interesting to me, and I, I prefer it this way myself. Okay. Do you find that when the when the roles are separated, there is a clash and less things get done. Yeah, I, I do. I do think that. And, and, and often in scenarios where I've been ahead of marketing, but not ahead of product, I've often find myself in a position where I feel like I have a better handle on what we should be doing based on market understanding and the competitive right. landscape. Right. Cause you think about the resources that a, a, a good marketing leader has access to analysts, folks like you guys as major influencers in a space, 
client conversations, events, there's a ton of signal that comes in through marketing. And if you're properly ingesting that signal and get a point of view about what should happen, sometimes you're in some ways more informed even than the product team. And so if you have to then filter all of your ideas into the product team and hope they understand it all, then it can right. slow things down and create friction points, right? Um, and then similarly on the product side, when I've had product but not marketing, <laughs> Yep. You know, there's often technology constraints and limitations and, you know, things you got to work around that other folks aren't aware of. When you have that whole picture in one view, it allows you to juke and weave in ways that is more flexible, more nimble, right. more who, responsive, who and yet still customers? achieve the ultimate end game, right? Who owns customers? Uh, so we have, a, we have a CRO function. Uh, right. So uh, Catherine Evans on our team runs that and she owns that whole uh a from an ae like existing customers as well as new customer segmentation so support everything yeah and then we have a slightly separate function where we have customer success as well and those right. teams work in concert with the account perfect. owners right uh, yeah that's so it's it's a pretty sophisticated model yeah. um but it, it gives us a pretty good and we all work obviously very closely together to try to understand oh, yeah. client needs and how things are evolving etc so what what is a talent neuron and what problem do we solve? Yeah. Um, so first, you know, I'm still new enough that I am I remain in awe a little bit of what this company does and how it does it. Uh, I think for those of us who have been in the space a little while, uh, it's kind of a, a little bit of a wish fulfillment for me in that it's a massive big data AI machine learning based company. And what we do is we ingest all kinds of demand signal in the form of job posts on a global basis, supply data about the available people in a given market, right? and then cost data from a variety of sources, including what gets published into job posts. And we're basically gathering all of that kind of information for 40 countries in the world, representing collectively about 90% of the world's GDP, where we know talent demand, talent supply, and talent cost. Things like skills, things like the employee value proposition, things like um, where are people hiring? What skills are they hiring for in different locations? Who's hiring for what talent? Right. And all of that enables us to basically take all that raw data and through AI and machine learning, we can distill all that into signal and actually make sense of it in ways that companies can then do things like play in their next location based on available talent today and what that talent's going to look like a few years out do things like if I could hire in Austin or Boston or Bangalore, what's the mix of demand versus supply and what's the cost of it? And where's the most likely place I'm going to be successful in bringing that talent together, right? Maybe I want to understand what my competitors are doing as they're thinking about AI and machine learning skills. What roles are they putting those skills in? Where in the world are they hiring for that stuff? Where should I be looking based on what my competitors are doing? And am I doing things in a way that's inconsistent with market? We can look at the way that skills are being asked for inside of the 1.5 million job posts we get per day across the world. And we can say, hey, these are new skills. These are emerging or growing skills. These skills are core that are asked for all the time for this kind of role. And maybe these skills used to be core, but now they're not being asked for as frequently. So something's changing. The skills yeah. evolving, it's declining, it's, be it's becoming assumed that you just have that skill. And so it gives us an ability to then say things like, well, today you're hiring for this kind of person, but the market, when they hire for the same role, they're looking for this. And you're this no is, longer this is how you keeping compare. up with, yeah, this is how you compare, right? Right. So, so all of that collectively gives folks like intelligence to know not just what's going on inside my business, but what's going on in my competitor landscape, inside the market what's evolving, what's changing, what's available, and how can I make better strategic decisions around all of that to right. basically future-proof or de-risk my, my strategy going forward. Two, two questions uh, here, take them any way you want. So one is, who are we selling to? Who's, who's the company? What's your target, your ICP? And then second yep. to that, and you, you've, you've, you've answered it somewhat here or, already, um, but I want to use a different word, trigger. What's the trigger point for that customer, potential customer to say, all right, I, I need a solution here. I need to solve this problem. So we know the yep. problem that you solve, but what's that trigger point that you find they normally yep. come to you? Yeah. So 
The target demo for us historically has been what I would call the Fortune 2000. So organizations that typically have a multinational footprint of some kind, often multi-regional. Some of, some of our companies that we support are in literally like 110 countries in the world, right? They're everywhere. Um, and they're struggling with, you know, how do I solve for where do I hire? So it's a TA, very strategic, high-level TA challenge, right? So if I can hire in any of 110 locations, what's my best strategy to do wage arbitrage or to look at skill availability, speed of hire, competitiveness, you know, that type of thing, right? Where can I go find pockets of talent that I otherwise don't know exist, right? And discover inequities in the market that I can exploit, either cost or talent availability. And so the other key use case beyond strategic TA is really what I would call workforce planning. I know strategic workforce plan has kind of got like a, mm -hmm. I'm not sure, I'm sure it's one of those words that people have talked about for 20 years and no one's figured out. 100%. But, but, but in this case, like a lot of what our clients do squarely fall into that bucket, like location planning right. or like skills analysis, build versus buy versus bot frameworks, comparing internal capabilities to what the market is looking for to see where my deltas exist, right? So they're, they're I wouldn't say it's full blown, strategic workforce planning, but there's very significant, substantial pieces of it that right. clients are trying to solve for within the framework. So people analytics teams, um, folks who are on strategic workforce planning, talent AC intelligence, level, business yeah. transformation, talent intelligence. It's those kind of things where they're looking for an understanding of markets and the talent in them writ large to support strategic planning and strategic thinking. Do y'all don't Does bump up against, bit? yeah, yeah. Y'all don't bump up. Uh, we do. I mean, uh, you know, especially now that they're giving it away. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, you know, everybody yeah. and their brother, you know, is looking for cost savings nowadays, right? 100%. Uh, but yeah, I know there, there are folks who, who see but that they don't as have an all, alternate. They don't have all three. If I yeah, remember correct. right, yeah. they, do, they do the supply and demand, but they don't have comp. Yeah. And the, the other piece that we often hear from clients is, you know, it's all self-reported, right? So one right. of the things that we right. pride ourselves on is... You know, we're getting our data from governmental sources, NGOs, like yeah. trade unions, like census data from various government entities. Right. Hard and data. Then we supplement. Yeah, hard data. We do supplement that with social data, right? Because sure. why wouldn't you, right, as yeah. a secondary data source? But so not a primary. From, um, yeah. And then from a demand perspective, they're only aware of the demand they're aware of. We're That's scraping right. from millions right. and millions right. of co company websites directly, also from the big job boards. We de dupe it all. Yeah. So it's just a bigger data set to make more informed decisions. Which is against. great. Which is absolutely yeah. great. Let me let me ask because there has been products in the past that have that have been supply and demand, but I love sure. the three prong, you know, of basically mixing in cost or comp uh, into this. What's the workflow for people so we we understand the market that you're going after? Do they need to see this in their ATS, or is yeah, it is so, it a standalone? Like where where do they see this data? Yeah, yeah. So there's there's a couple of different scenarios, right? So if you think about something like hiring analysis, some of that can happen externally where I'm looking at the availability of talent in a market right. and really thinking strategically, where should I go? But you're right, William. I mean, like the logical place you'd eventually want to see that stuff is inside your ATS or CRM. We're starting to explore those relationships. Right. Um, if, you're, if you weren't aware, we were previously held by Gartner for a long, long time. We broke away about a year and a half ago now. Um, Gartner, because they're Gartner, didn't typically yeah. engage in a lot of those partner kind of relationships. Right, they're not. So a, we're starting that journey now. Yeah. Um, we actually just um, built a relationship with Beamery yeah. that will specifically allow okay. you to take some of our data, not all of it, but relevant pieces around like talent supply, demand, hiring difficulty, and bring that into oh, the talent cool. calibration process right. directly inside the Beamery interface. Um, and now we're exploring really other interesting things we could do together to even look at like competitiveness, what, who the competitors are in the space, location optionality, and things like that to try to embed some of that intelligence into your calibration and decision-making process at the point of building out the rec. Um, so we're starting that journey, I would say, William, and I think that's the right way to think about it. For other things like competitive analysis, general skills analysis of a market or a role, um, Things like location analysis as I'm planning where my next center of excellence will be or my next office or my next factory. Many of those are standalone sort of planning decisions which can exist outside the flow of a typical HRIS. 
right? Um, but that said, we are exploring additional partnerships, folks like One Model Workday, trying to figure out how our data and where our data fits in their backend data structures. Who, who, who are you selling to in the organizations? Are we are we selling to talent leaders? Are we at the at the CHRO level? Where, where exactly are? We? Yeah, it, it's varied. Uh, so CHROs for sure, um, heads of TA, um, regional heads of TA. If the company's big enough, right. many of the many of our clients are. Um, it might also be um, head of people analytics, head of talent intelligence. Um, it could potentially be someone in charge of digital transformation or business transformation, who's looking at this data set as a supporting. Uh, yep. data play in that in ma making those decisions right um but that's that's pretty much the universe in which we're typically operating i'm gonna i'm gonna add uh probably the coo and the Sometimes. cfo yep. at some yep. point because mm -hmm. the coo is is usually in charge of that next plant and stability and the cfo yeah, exactly cares deeply about cost occasionally so, it might be someone in charge of location planning for yep. that same reason mm -hmm. yeah, they yeah. want you know, they have rental data, they have, you know, right. governmental regulatory data. They don't have data, talent data. But they don't know. No. I can't tell you how many times people have come to us after they put a plant somewhere. <laughs> how You're do like, I hire people? Was, yeah, great. It was really cost effective yeah. to build there, but I can't staff no, it. Yeah. So you, now you, what? You, you, know? you got really yeah. treat property, and that's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. You have no exactly. talent. We um, have, no. Um, we, we've got, not too far from me, David, we've got a, it's, it's out in farmland. Like okay. far, close enough that it's commutable, but not really. Commu but there's some big healthcare companies out there. Oh yeah, and they sure. can't staff it. They no. just they just can't staff it because coming from either direction, because they're going to use talent neuron. That's exactly, why yeah, right? yeah, you're going through cities to get to the farmland. Yeah, and it's just it's too much of a commute on the way back and and in. It's yep. it's ridiculous, and I don't think they actually planned for that. They right. just said cheap. We're getting yeah. incentives. Yep. Big facility. We can do this. Yeah. And that's it. Well, yeah, it only you, takes a few of those before someone says, hey, maybe we should look at talent next time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I have a, there's a guy in Dallas that I've known for a long time, and that's what he does for like Whole Foods mm -hmm. is he does site planning. Yeah. He does yeah. this for several big companies and uh, grocery, retail, all of the hourly so stuff. They need to know where to yep. put their next little place. Like they, yeah. Okay, but they've got ways to do the demographics of the buyer yeah. and all that stuff. They've got some tools that do all that stuff. They don't have talent. I, right. And I think what gets really interesting about that, William, is like if you know some of the demographics of the area, you might think you know. Huh. But here's huh. where things get hairy. Who else is hiring for that same talent? That's right. Right. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we do in our competitive module is it's not just go identify your known obvious competitors who are your right. business competitors. Right. But at a role level, yeah. who else is posting for the same kind of talent in the same locations you are? Right. So that who gets, are your, that, who are your gets, talent competitors? Yeah, that right? gets messy in the hourly market because yeah. the person Bingo. that's applying to Walmart is also applying to AT&T and Taco yep. Bell right. and Starbucks. Exactly. So exactly. it's not like they're they're only applying to uh Fast and then an Amazon shots. fulfillment center pops in, and they forget and it. it You're done, everybody. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. It's so true, right? I mean, I was yeah. working at healthcare source for a while, and um, we were supporting like things like long-term care facilities, and yeah. with yeah. with talent strategies, nursing homes, assisted living, and God forbid an Amazon fulfillment center opened up nearby or a UPS. All those people are getting paid thirteen dollars an hour to be a CNA can now be a seventeen dollar an hour factory worker. And it would just pull the lifeblood out of the company, right? Yeah. And so now I'm here. I can actually see all that. Like right. for any company, I can see who else are you fighting for, for the same kind of talent. And what's that competitive concentration and the drain that it's putting on your location strategy, right? It's fascinating yeah. what you can do now. Where where do you find most companies are struggling at this, at this level? So they're complex enough that they need you, right? Yeah. They're large enough that they, they know they need you. They, they bring you in. Are they struggle once they get the the information? What's that next step for them? Are you recommending? Are you helping them at that point? They're on their own. Where where are they struggling? Yeah, yeah. So so there's a couple things. I'll start with like the shifting nature of what people are trying to solve for, which is fascinating to me. And then I'll talk a little bit about how we're bridging that gap, Ryan, because it's not even as sophisticated as the clients are that we support. They still need help sometimes for what yeah. to do with yeah. the analysis, right? 
So the first thing I'll share with you guys that I think is crazy, and I guess not unexpected, with all the changes that the world's been through over the last like five years, right? But like global pandemic, war, like you yeah, know, yeah. recession, Little bounce stuff. back from recession, supply yeah. chain disruption. Oh my God, AI, everybody, let's do social, AI. So, right? Social revolution, social unrest, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Just a few, just a few things, right? Minor causes, stuff. minor, minor stuff. things, right? So everybody and their brothers now, like, hey, where are we today relative to where we need to be, and where are we relative to where the competitors are and where the market is? So there is a very, very high level of scrutiny right now among a pretty high percentage of our clients and prospects coming in to understand what talent and skills do I have now and where the hell are they in the world? And right. what talent and skills do I need to get where I'm trying to go? And how far off am I? And depending on how far off I am, what's am I going to build it? Am I going to buy it? Am I going to automate it away? And if I am going to buy it, where am I buying it? And where can I find it? And at what cost? And then the right. FOMO and the FOMO that's running parallel to that is what the hell is everybody else doing? Bingo. Bingo. Right. right. And, you know, what are my competitors doing around AI? Where are they putting those skills? Where are they hiring for those skills? How are they thinking about this problem? And am I thinking about it the right? Where am I relative to them? And what? And that's just one small example Like you could say the same thing about other critical roles. Right. So that's been a big shifting nature of asks in the last year or so, Ryan. Mm. But then the follow on is like, okay, great. So now we've done this analysis. We know what your gap is. Here's the percentage of this role that's going to be automated. Here's the percentage of this role that you can find easily in the market. But this other part you would have built. So then it's the whole, well, what's your build by strategy? Mm -hmm. How should you be thinking about internal mobility? How should you be implementing? And, you know, it's sometimes it's silly things. Like we were dealing with one of our clients who was looking for marketers. And one of the constraints they were putting on it was, well, they need to have B2B experience, <laughs> right? Which, you know, that's, you know, yeah, super you know, relevant. We were able to show them, if you take that B2B skill set off the table and that B2B experience, your available talent pool triples. Right. And then why don't you just put a little training program together about what's different between B2C and B2B? Yeah. And then you just opened up 3X the talent available to you, and then you yeah. can train them on the gap, right? But that kind of... Think hybrid, think, you know, blended. Yeah. Don't just think TA, don't just think talent development. How are you going to bring these things together to build the talent that you need for the future? We're providing a lot of strategic consulting and support for that yeah. as a separate function. So we we run it all through our normal, you know, uh, platform, but then we can engage in specific strategic consulting engagements to support clients in that way. We can also, Ryan, do like research projects like Bespoke, so I mentioned we're mm -hmm. in 40 countries, you know, if you want, you want to report on Bolivia, we don't, that's not in the platform, but our research team can go and do that for you or right. discover manufacturing talent in Bangladesh, for example. Right. Um, and then build out a report of talent availability and that type of thing. Typically we include a certain number of reports in your contract so that you can go beyond what's natively in the platform and do secondary and tertiary analysis with support from our research team as well. I want to ask a couple of buy sides questions real quick yeah uh, we'll start off with your most recent favorite customer story without disclosing names we don't need to know their name but like something there was before talent neuron and after talent neuron and so what what story do you got for us actually I, I think i think one of the best ones is that is the one i started to relate which was one of our clients was really uh at an impasse about their inability to hire a sufficient number of marketing folks, given the geographies in which they were operating. And we were able to show them with data what was available in the market, why it was so constrained, why the nature of their approach to the problem was the root cause of the problem. It wasn't just they throwing thought money it, at it. If, if, yeah, yeah, right. Like, how about, how about think differently, yeah. right? You're spending, yeah. you're spending this amount of money on recruiting to go get these very specialized people when if you choose to get less specialized people, you open your talent yeah. supply and then you can use those same dollars you were spending there on a training program. Right. right. And, and now you're not, now you're not like solving that problem at a point in time through Herculean effort, you're building capability and you're building right. a deep systemic ability to be successful over time yeah. by fundamentally changing the dynamics of the problem. 
And that's only possible when you have the visibility into that external data right. and the way that external data is interacting with your strategy to drive the outcome that was happening, right? So that's a super simple example, but you know, other ones that I think are really interesting are all the stuff we're doing lately with internal skill, like identification versus external mobility. and mobility and recommendations on build versus buy. But even some of those basic, basic things are still really useful to companies as they're trying to sort through just how to be successful in a very difficult, challenging labor market. So I don't know if you can answer this. I want to put it out there because nice. um, you just, you're here, what, last year, right? The year? Uh, yeah, I came, I came yeah. in October. So In October? Yeah. Okay. So we remember telling Noron from a long time back. Yeah. What's that evolution look like? So somebody like me, for example, or that, you know, I was in corporate at the time, long time ago, I have a vision of what talent Noron was or what the sure. capability was. What is that? I mean, with obvious, there's, there's obvious changes and evolution that, that happened. Yeah, yeah. What are those big changes through the last, you know, six, seven, eight years that people need to be aware of? Oh, wow. That's a great question. Uh, so I guess the first thing I'd say is we're way easier to do business with than we were before. Uh, mm -hmm. In the past, we sold, the only way we sold was as the full platform. Right. Yeah. You had to buy regions of country data at a pop. Um, you, we didn't have a strategic consulting arm in the way right. we do today. Mm -hmm. So we've broken a lot of that apart, Ryan. So now we've broken into modules. So there's a hiring analysis module. There's a location analysis module. There's mm -hmm. a skills analysis module, right? So we're allowing people to sort of buy in against the key problems they're currently facing right. and the specifics of what they're solving for, which has brought the average price point down pretty considerably to make it more accessible, more to mid-market or large mm -hmm. market players, but also, frankly, to find cost advantage even among large players who were previously getting charged for the whole dang platform and not using only it. using. So we've, mm -hmm. we've price adjusted a lot of people to get them to something that is reasonable and makes sense for their usage pattern, right? Um, we also changed from a very heavy dependence license wise on your license or price wise on your licenses. We've minimized that so that people can more democratize access and make it more widely available in the business. So it's more priced now by the module and by the country coverage, the actual cost per license. We want to minimize that so people can spread that out a lot. Right. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing was going from like global or very regional coverages to pick mix and match specific countries because each business is different. They're in different parts of the world. It was too limiting. So that's a massive change in the whole go-to-market, yeah. which has made the, made us able to better tailor what people have bought against their actual needs, right? The other big thing is the availability of strategic consulting. So previously that was sort of handled when we were under Gartner and by the Gartner analyst team. When we separated, you know, there really wasn't anything that sort of filled that gap of like, okay, I got all this analysis, what do I do? Or how do I teach my team to be better data storytellers or to better communicate HR and talent issues through data? Like we can do that kind of consulting too, because that's what we live and breathe every day. Or we can take you through a whole build by analysis globally for a region, for a location, for a role, for a set of roles, for a job family. So we can go really, really big or pretty narrow to specific things. And then I think the last thing I'd say um, that's, that's another major, major shift is, um, you know, I think that we saw opportunities when we separated to really double down on our global data coverage. You know, we were, we were in a lot of countries before. We weren't as um, diligent maybe as we should have been about having all three of those pillars, the supply, demand, and salary in all those locations. We've put a massive effort forth this year to yeah. make sure that across all 40 countries, not only do we have all three of those data points, but they're refreshed and updated and have a recency to them. India, for example, we've updated salary there three times this year because there's wage inflation going on. And so right. what we had six months ago is not accurate today, right? And so we're taking a much more proactive approach to data freshness and ensuring that what's there is like up to date, right? So those are probably the biggest changes. You know, what you're going to see next year is we're starting to really double down in that universe of strategic workforce planning you know, scenario driven stuff, what if analysis, really Same getting box. serious. Yes. Yeah. yeah. More playful kind of things that That's allow cool. you to take in internal data 
with external data and then model some stuff to see Play what's my best. Yeah, what's my best Finan- path forward? Finance will love that, especially in the M and A folks. Yeah, they'll love that because then they can they have a sandbox. They can yeah. then look at that and see what they have. Well, I think, you know, I think what's happening, things. what's happening, William, is I think companies are, you know, 15 years ago when some of this technology first really started emerging at scale, you know, it was, it, people were in awe. Like, what do you mean I can get like, you know, salary posts for like 20 countries in the world all at once and, and analyze that and see what that means and use AI to distill signal from what is otherwise just an unstructured job post, right? I think people were just amazed that you could do any of that, right? But now as we've gotten more sophisticated with data, as large language models have come out, you know, people are asking way more sophisticated questions. Like, hey, based on signal and what you see my competitors hiring for and what job titles and what skills and where in the world and what's the difference in the new hiring rate versus their previous organic rate Is that something I should pay attention to? Like, can you just tell me if I give you a list of competitors who were making moves that I should be interested in diagnosing, right? Like that's kind of the next level of this stuff is like turning, turning this stuff into insights and triggers and actionable moments where someone can go, oh, wait a second, what's going on there? And across the board. That's where we're moving now, and that's where the space is starting to move, is to move beyond just having the data to really making sense of it and deriving insights from it, you know? So for the audience's edification, what do we call ourselves? You might have already said it, but I want to make sure. Uh, You mean the company name? Yeah. No, No, Talent talent I, run. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> that was fantastic. I love that. that. that no, that's that's going to be the opener to the, uh, what do we I, call ourselves? Talent yeah, thanks. Nor- Noron. Thanks. I, 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 I scheduled the show. I'm, I'm pretty much like, <laughs> no, the, uh, the, uh, Mike walks off stage. <laughs> category. Cause we, it could be a hiring intelligence. could be talent uh, intelligence. Like, uh, sure. What's the category ish. Thanks. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I think, I think the broad category has been called talent intelligence, I think is the, I think that's a, candidly, I think, William, that's not the best term for the space, right? Because Mm. I think Vizier or, you know, Cruncher or, you know, HR Workbench, I mean, they're all doing talent intelligence too, but it's inside your company data, right? Um, So I think it's, you know, it's some combination of like external talent intelligence or market talent intelligence, you know, it's something along those lines. I think you go the is, other thing, would you go as yeah. niche as hiring, hiring intelligence? Mm, I don't think so, because I think okay. some of what we're opining on is when not to hire. Right. And, and when you should build or when right. you should automate or, or so buy, you know. The reason yeah. I asked the, the question wasn't just to learn a company name, was <laughs> the, uh, what questions, if they haven't bought this before, let's say it's yeah. talent intelligence, keep it simple for the audience. Sure, sure. What questions should they be asking in the buying process? Because, like you mentioned, things yeah. like data recency and and things yeah, like that. Like, yeah. What should they be asking? Because they've never, let's say, they've never bought this. Yeah. What should I, they I be asking? At the at the root, I, I think you know the, the the interesting thing about the space is like there's sort of two root things that both have to be good to to have a good solution. One is data quality, right? right. So really understanding. Where is this data coming from? You know, per my comments earlier, listen, I like LinkedIn. It's a great solution, but it's all self-reported, right? So if you're looking for statistically valid, defensible data, eh, you know, it's a little, little sketch, right? So making sure that people are pulling in governmental sources, NGOs, trade unions, banging that up against a dedupe model, and that you have really deep statistical analysis and AI tools to get all that right so that when you do say something about something, you know, that you have high degrees of confidence in it, or at least as high as you can. The other thing I'd say related to that, William, that is also really important is you want a vendor who's transparent about what they know and don't know. Right. Right. There are places in the world where we can't get that same level of data quality, not because for want of trying on our part, because it doesn't exist. There isn't an NGO. There isn't a governmental entity. We're doing the research ourselves and compiling it, which, and then, basing it on surveys in some cases, right? That has less statistical you right. know, certainty than when we can cross validate against five other sources, right? And so we're very open about that and transparent. 
because at the end of the day, our clients are making multi-million dollar decisions on these this data points. And you don't want them to make a decision on some with it's mm -hmm. we are we are falsely implying a level of precision or quality that may not be present. We at least want them to know with eyes open what they're basing these decisions on, right? Which then in some cases leads them to do secondary checks or tertiary checks and makes them do additional diligence rather than just rely on us, right? So I think all of that is really important. And I think the second thing that's really, really important is what then can I do with the data? What insights can I derive? How do I use that data successfully? Is it easy to access? Is it easy to make sense of? Um, can I manipulate it in different ways? And then I think if there's a third thing, the third thing would be, given that a lot of companies are still beginning to develop maturity in this area, can I get an assist? You know, per Ryan's comment earlier, you know, can can you guys help me when I'm stuck or I need extra hands or I'm, I'm timeline constrained or a, I'm looking, they're looking for analysis that I can't complete on my own. It's too much. Like, can, can the vendor step in and help you with that in a way that once they're done, they hand it over to you and you can continue on on your own and you haven't then manufactured a dependence forever on a third party consultancy, right? Where, where in the conversation or demo and the sales process, do you find that prospects get to this point in that demo and they're just like, yes. This yeah. is, this is it. This is the solution. The, the aha moment. Yeah. The aha moment. I think when I've seen the lights go on is when you can take somebody from that first question that they ask and then chain them three levels deep to three other things they never thought to ask that'll be critical to their success. Right. So as an example, you know, the thing that we're hearing is well, everywhere, as I'm sure you guys are hearing it everywhere. How do I find AI, AI talent? Where do I find AI talent? How should I pay for AI? What are my competitors doing? So we can start with, here's what's going on with your competitors. Here's where they're hiring this talent. These are the kind of skills they're looking for. These are the tools that they're looking for, which is also super interesting to folks usually, right? Where in the world are they doing that? Which then leads to, okay, if that's where that's happening, what's like, what skills should I be looking for in, in those areas? What skills exist in those areas? And from a location standpoint, am I present there? What skills am I looking for? Am I looking for those same skills? So now we're branching from what are my competitors to doing to what am I currently doing? Right. Right. Yeah. And then we go, okay, great. I definitely want to hire those skills in Bangalore. Who else is hiring in Bangalore right now? And now with our latest launch of our new module, our employee value proposition module, we can even tell you in Bangalore for an AI role, what are the EVPs that they're pitching? Oh, cool. Right. Mm. So now I can see, I can go from this very high level of like right. what's going on competitively down to what's our, what's in the job posts in Bangalore for an AI engineer for my three main talent competitors in that location. And how does my EVP stack up? And from there, I can even drill into the specific examples in the job posts and see the specific job mm. posts. So Ryan, that's when people's, you know, they have the click. They're like, whoa, I can go from like this global competitive view all the way down to the specific job post that yeah. collectively informed all of that. And they I forgot the first. original question. Yeah, because right, because now we're answering, right? Because now we're answering, yeah. well, okay, because your real question isn't yeah. what are my competitors doing? It's going to be how do I outcompete my competitors for those same talents? Right. And so we could show them like what you're really asking is this. So let's tell you how to get there. And then we can show them that whole path through the different modules and how they interconnect to deliver that kind of insight, right? That's usually when people go, whoa, okay, I got it now. Yeah. So last question for me is, uh, what's success for you for the rest of the year? Like, where do you want to be uh, yep. by by 25 and then maybe by this time next year? Like, what's, yep. where, 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 where are we trying to be? Yeah. So, um. So right now we're in the midst of launching our first generative AI chatbot, which is super exciting. It's in closed beta with clients. It'll be launched general availability by end of year. That's basically like a chat GPT type of interface. We've been really thoughtful about the design. It's no IPs going out publicly. There's no ability for it to hallucinate in the way it's been built. Um, but it basically allows you to interrogate the system, but with a very natural uh, chat GPT type of experience, right? Um, so that's pretty cool. We're excited to get that launched. We're also launching um, a candidate profile capability 
where once you've done your hiring analysis and we've set up where in the world is the right place for you to go find data engineers, for example, and we say, okay, it's Bangalore or it's, you know, Seattle. And we can say, well, who in Seattle is available? What's that talent pool look like? And even begin to surface names for you to then add to a sourcing tool or something oh, wow. along those lines. So we're moving beyond just the pure analysis mm -hmm. to closer to actionability, right? And that's the second thing I'd say, William, is over time, what you're going to see from us is we're going to be making that move from just having the data to like be making it much more actionable, scenario driven, what if driven. A big thing we're going to do next year is really double down on our competitive intelligence module. It's already pretty robust, but we think we can do things like expose what tools people are hiring for, which could be really interesting to CTOs and CIOs. Now that so many countries and so many um, states are now starting to publish salary data in job right. posts, we think we can do things where we could expose maybe not what they're really paying, but what they say they're going to pay. So you can and compare that, that to what you say you're going to pay and then combine that with our EVP data and even tell you, well, bonus is also part of that. RSUs are part of that. You know, they have a pet insurance benefit. Like we can give you like that whole nuanced picture, not of what they're generally doing, but what they did yesterday. Right. Like what did your competitor put in a job post yesterday? Right. So we think some of that will be really interesting competitively. So what that's what you're going to see from us is really kind of more making sense of the data and delivering more actionable insights hmm. and allowing for more scenario driven planning and that type of thing. So two two things for from me. Pet insurance again has come <laughs> up. David like every other episode, pet insurance is coming is it up. Really? Oh my god. And this started back a couple years ago we were doing a, a live show and the first guest was nationwide, and mm, it okay. was pet insurance. Mm? I didn't know what right. to talk. I, I Ryan, was like, you Ryan's got this, head, brother. Ryan's you, head almost <laughs> exploded. <laughs> like, because as a lady sat down, she pushed her cart over, and she goes, "I'd really like to talk about pet insurance." I'm like, "All right, let's go." Uh, Sounds like, yeah, fun. Not, not let's sure do how we're this. doing this, but let's. Ryan, uh, I looked at Ryan, <laughs> and I thought he like had an aneurysm. <laughs> like he's like, I, 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 I understand the value. I get right. it. But I'm like, an sure. hour on that? Like, yeah. how are we going to do That's a long that? time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did yeah, you do yeah. it? Were you successful? Yeah. You, you he, made oh, it. he can talk about anything. <laughs> he can talk about the paint on your wall and take you down. Yeah. No, it, it was, it was fantastic. <laughs> All right. Final question for me, David, is how far out is Talent Noron thinking? What are you planning for? Are you looking just next year and a year after? I mean, are, are you 10 years down the line? Where are you guys at in terms of planning? How far out do you? Yeah, so um, so I personally think in three year increments. I think candidly, much beyond that is um, yeah. the world's going to change too much. Yeah, um, you know, uh, and and the CEO shares my worldview about that. So, you know, I the way I would describe it, Ryan, is like in the next six months, we have very clear, very well laid out plans with clear milestones, timelines, et cetera. Yeah. The next six month chunk is typically um, very directionally on point. And we know the sort of the shape of it. After that, we sort of move to the next year, right? And that mm -hmm. year is sort of a directional, like, let's plan a flag here. This might mean M&A. This might mean organic build. Right. These are the kind of partnerships we'd want to chase, right? Yeah. Um, it gets so I, fuzzier. The yeah, it gets a little up. fuzzier. Mm -hmm. But, like, you know, the North Star for us is is this notion of making things actionable and intellig in, it, it more intelligent in the actual display of the information and the uh, insights it delivers. Yeah. So you will continue to see us make more and more sense of the data we have, but also layer in other data points that would increase the level of contextual understanding and insight uh, that you can derive from the data. So that's the North Star. There yeah. will be specific jukes and weaves we'll make along the way. Yeah. But we will be breaking out of just being a pure talent intelligence. Here's some data right. into a much more actionable place, you know, really for the next six months and beyond. Josh right. Mike walks off stage. David, so great to talk to you. Well, uh, you too. Uh, well, we've, we've, we should have had more discussions over the years because I get smarter every time I talk to you. So just thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for educating the audience and good luck to everything you're doing with Talent Neuron.